that time, Protestant, uh, many Protestant ministers mobilized their congregations to vote against the Catholic candidates. So there was truly a Protestant mobilization vis-a-vis -vis the Catholics to deny Catholics this obvious post of enormous um, political power. So religion then was clearly a significant uh, point of division in the society in these two episodes. Race was also important. Um, there are any number of indicators um, of the problematic racial position at that time of the, of the new immigrant populations, as they were then called, from Southern and Eastern Europe, particularly the Jews um, and the Catholics. Um, the first applications of IQ testing in the United States occurred in a context where they were used on new recruits to the American army to show that those coming from Jewish backgrounds had lower <clears throat> IQs than, than others. This is, of course, you know, extremely surprising to anybody who has the cliches of today in mind. Um, but, they, but they also showed, of course, that the others were inferior intellectually, the Italians, um, and so forth. And then, in the middle of the century, in the period 1945 to 70, the 25 years following World War II, um, enormous changes took place. So that by 1970, one could truly say that a social boundary that had been very prominent in mid-20th century America hadn't disappeared, but it had really faded and was no longer very potent in determining people's life chances, in determining who, you know, who was friends with whom, who even married whom. And we have a number of indicators of these changes. So on education, which we were just discussing, so we know from the early 20th century literature that there was a big gap between the white mainstream and the children coming from Italian immigrant families, an educational gap. There was a lot of literature on the problems facing Italian families in American schools. The Italians had low rates of school completion. Um, their families put them to work as, you know, as soon as they were legally able to work, um, taking them out of school, et cetera, et cetera. Between 1945 and 1970, they caught up. So in just 25 years, they erased the educational gap. By 1970, the cohorts of young people leaving school were ones in which there was really not, at least in the aggregate, a discernible gap between the, southern, the children of Italians and, and the others. In the early 20th century, also, in higher education, in, especially in elite colleges, there were quotas imposed on Jews to keep them, their numbers low. Um, and, uh, you know, these lasted through the war, but in the aftermath of the war, they were thrown out. And by 1970, um, you know, Harvard, Yale, etc., had very large contingents of Jewish students. And, for the first time, they had significant numbers of Jewish faculty. So, here we had two changes. One was the quantitative change which resembles the current gaps um, between the Italians and the others. And the other was a qualitative change in which a group that had been steered away from the elite sectors of education was now really granted uh, untrammeled access <clears throat> to those sectors. We know that rates of intermarriage rose, um, and that was true even though American Jews had developed a variety of social institutions to try to keep their children from outmarrying. So before 1960, the rate of, uh, among Jews of outmarriage with non-Jews was under 10%. By 1980, it was about 50%. So again, within a very short historical period, there was a tremendous change in uh, what we could call the sort of opportunity structure, in this case, um, for intermarriage. And perhaps finally, uh, most importantly, but su I suppose a little uh, less easy to document in strict quantitative terms, 
we can see that Catholicism and Judaism now became regarded as part of the mainstream society rather than religions that were on the margins of the mainstream society. A famous book published in 1955 by the sociologist Will Herberg called Protestant Catholic Jew began to document um, these changes. Okay, why? This is the, we want, what we want to understand is why did this happen and could something like it happen again? Okay, so um, it's a puzzle and um, people have tried to develop answers and I want to express my opinion straight out that I don't find those answers very satisfactory. Um, and I think in social science in the United States, um, there's a great deal of attention because of the nature of today's society to racial oppression. Yes, we have you know, racial oppression in the United States. But we have to be careful not to read all of the past in terms of the lenses of today. But according to racial oppression then, the key is to becoming white. And so the historians have developed what has become widely accepted called whiteness theory, which basically asserts that um, what happened is that through the efforts of the ethnics themselves, in part, they moved from a position of being problematic as whites to acceptance as full whites. And that was particularly true after World War II. And once they gained this acceptance, all of the barriers that they confronted crop. Now, this must be plausible because many people believe it, but um, the sociologist, I think, should object to it. And the objection should be the following, that we know from many, many, many settings that privileged groups don't simply give up their privileges that easily. Why, then, would Protestant whites, who had struggled in the first part of the 20th century, to maintain their privileges, closing off the Ivy League colleges to Jews, shutting out the Catholics from achievement of national political power. Why would they suddenly say, oh, they've been white. Okay, now they're, they're with us. It doesn't really make sense. And there's an easy counterfactual alternative to what happened. And that is, and it's by the way, a counterfactual alternative that the sociologists of the 1950s thought was transpiring before their eyes. And that is that America would become a three-tier society. That yes, there would be non-whites at the bottom, but that the white population above non-whites would continue to be divided between Protestant middle-class whites and working-class um, Catholic whites with kind of Jews and a kind of ambiguous position because they weren't really working class, but they weren't really going to be socially acceptable, um, uh, at least at the elite strata of the, of the Protestant whites. So the question we have to ask is, how come this didn't happen? How come the boundaries among whites became so faint in this critical 25-year period? So I want to propose an alternative theory and then ask if we can try to apply it um, to, the, to the present. And <clears throat> I guess you could say that this is a kind of historicized version of contact theory because it establishes a set of circumstances under which some members of the minority populations are going to rise to be equal in their social and economic status with members of the already established groups come into closer contact with them and in which there's going to be an ideology believed by the established groups that favors accepting these, these individuals in their midst. So on the one hand, we had what I'm calling non-zero-sum mobility. It's, it, and here the, the quantitative indicators are very clear. Um, and this is really a post-World War II phenomenon. So at the university ranks, there was an enormous expansion of the number of places available to students. Between 1940 and 1970, it's literally true, 
that the number of places expanded by a factor of five. So in just 30 years, this happened. And it came about, this is also, I think, instructive for the current circumstances, it came about because of public investment. It was not that Harvard, Yale, et cetera, expanded. It was that many state university systems were either founded or expanded. In my own state, New York, the state university system was founded in 1948. At that moment, it brought together 30 small colleges with about 30,000 students. By 1970, there were 300,000 students enrolled in the State University of New York. And everywhere you look, there was post-World War II expansion, and it was publicly funded um, in large part. The, the, of course, there were also changes in the occupational structure, so that all of these new people coming out with newly minted degrees could find jobs. You know, there was shrinkage at the bottom in, in the working among the working classes. There was expansion in sort of the middle and upper middle ranks, where a college education was a, a meaningful credential um, to getting a job. But there was not just rise in status. And by the way, of course, this non-zero-sum mobility meant that Protestant whites didn't experience any loss in the, the privileges of their children. Um, in fact, in many ways, they were doing better too. So it was, a, it was a, a, a historical period in which, as President Kennedy put it, all, all of boats were rising. But there was not just upward mobility. There was also a kind of lateral spatial mobility. And this was particularly true for whites. And this was the creation of suburb American suburbia, which was a post-World War II phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Again, sort of and really compressed in sort of the 1950s and the 1960s. New communities were created, literally. You know, from nothing sprang up new communities. And so there was no established group in these communities. And they attracted people coming from cities, whites, of diverse backgrounds. Uh, Herbert Gans did a study of one of the early uh, communities called Levittown. There were several Levittowns. And he, it was all white. There were no blacks allowed. It was racially segregated. But the whites were Protestants, Catholics, Jews from diverse national backgrounds. They were all at the same family stage. You know, They all had young children. Their children went to schools together. They played together. You had a knitting across what had been lines of division um, that you know couldn't have been anticipated 25 years earlier. Finally, there was an ideological change. And the ideological change was a product of the war itself. And um, without going into too much history, you know, the US state um, and society faced a problem in both world wars, how to meld a fighting force that came from diverse national origin backgrounds including people who had ancestors from the countries with which the United States was at war. And so during World War II, the solution was to highlight the melting pot nature of the American fighting forces um, in journalism during the war, in the novels and films following the war, there was enormous attention to the diversity of the fighting forces. There was a, almost a kind of stereotypical range of backgrounds. The Italian from the Bronx, the Jew from Brooklyn, the Swede from Minnesota, the German from Iowa, etc., who would all be part of this one fighting unit. And the result of that was to portray a moral equality among people from these different groups. So all of these factors came together. Okay, so. I talked a little longer than I thought, but let me try to move quickly because um, I think you can see where I'm going. So, what are the possibilities today? Well, there are some similarities, but there are also some big differences between the post-World War II situation and the situation today. On the one hand, we have a demographic transition in which the majority population is literally shrinking. And unless the economies of the wealthy societies altogether collapse, 
um, they are going to depend upon the labor of people coming 